In the beginning, said the Aztecs, the white men came in one boat. Nearly 500 years ago, Spanish adventurers landed on a small island off the coast of Mexico. It was the first contact between the civilizations of the old world and the new. The prelude to one of the greatest events in history. It's a story of almost incredible endurance, heroism, greed and brutality. And all the more poignant today as we see its long-term effects unfolding across the globe. It's known still in the Americas as the conquest, the conquista. And the larger-than-life men who achieved it are the conquerors, the conquistadors. The tale begins back in Spain, in the bleak land of Estremadura. They were warriors. They were the hardest warriors Spain produced. Men who left barefooted came back and built these incredible mansions. And they came back multi-millionaires. I mean, carrying the bars of silver, <laughs> the bars of gold. They shod their horses with silver. I was setting out to retrace four of the epic journeys of the conquistadors. Stuart Sterling's ancestor was one of them, and he took me back to where it all started. Well, this is one of the gates of the towers, and here we're coming to. Hola, Carmen, ¿qué tal? ¿Cómo estás? Muy bien, encantado. Miguel. Few places in history, it seems to me, are so charged with destiny. Gracias, ¿eh? The first of the great conquistadors was Hernán Cortés. He was a poor boy from the small town of Medellín, trained not in war, but in law. He's one of history's great names, but he's still a mystery. You know, it's funny, you set off on journeys like this, and you search for clues, and I find Cortés the most enigmatic of all the conquistadors. They say he was a sort of snob, unkind to little people. It wasn't said that he was a great womanizer and a gambler. Yes, yeah, someone I knew him says that although the family were poor, he uh, always dressed like a great lord as if he'd been born in brocade. <laughs> so this is the hero of our first story, if a hero can be someone who caused the fall of worlds. Most mighty prince, wrote Cortes to the king of Spain, let me begin at the beginning. We sailed our ships to the land called Yucatan. A 
self-made man, Cortes had financed his own expedition, 11 ships, 500 soldiers. Like Columbus, he didn't know what lay ahead. He thought the land they could see beyond Cuba was just islands through which they could sail to China. It was April 1519. for us to imagine the shock of the new for people of the 16th century. For us, it would be like landing on another planet. To discover that the new world also had great civilizations with law, writing and architecture, this was a revelation. What rational beings live here, wrote Cortes. This is the best and richest land that ever there was. The awestruck conquistadors christened one place El Gran Cairo. And so I set out in Cortez's footsteps. With me I took his letters and the memoirs of his companions. But the other side also has a voice in this story. The native peoples of the Americas are still here. They still speak their ancient languages, Mayan, Quechua, Aztec. And their story of the conquest has survived. The Aztec account was recorded after the conquest in their language by a Spanish friar, Bernardino de Sagun. That is not a Spanish version. It is an Indian version mm -hmm. of their own culture. Mm -hmm. Indian students mm -hmm. did this drawing. They corrected the information. They yeah. gave information to mm -hmm. him. Mm -hmm. So he used these people to have this true history, the true version of this Indian culture. Every aspect of life. From birth yeah. to death to Every worship kind of to all the lot. medicine and teaching yeah. and yeah. And this Aztec story of the conquest, Sagun says, came from the very best eyewitnesses. So he's saying that the people who gave him the story of the conquest, the Aztec people who gave him the story of the conquest, were important people of good judgment, and that we can take it for granted that they told the whole truth. Yeah. So you have to, because they were human, like the Spaniards were human. This was a, a war between two human kinds, not between animals and people. Cortes headed west to the Tabasco River, the frontier of the Mayan and the Aztec-speaking worlds. Still perhaps unsure of his next move, he landed in Frontier. The key to any close encounter is language, but Cortes couldn't talk to the Aztecs. He'd already found a Spanish sailor who spoke Mayan. And then, here in Frontera, he had his lucky break. Cortes was given a slave girl by a local chief. Her name was Malinali. But here in Mexico, everyone calls her Malinche. <laughs> Malinche spoke Mayan and Nahuatl, the Aztec language. Through her, he could talk to them. Cuando 
regresa a poder de los españoles, eh, Marina se sigue comportando como lo que es. Malinche was treated well by the Spanish, especially by Cortés. Some say she fell hopelessly in love with him. <laughs> yes, some say she was dazzled by the power of Cortés. And how she's paid for it. Traitor, whore, goddess of death. For nearly 500 years, Mexicans have argued about Malinche and her relationship with Cortés. He was very handsome. Of course they were in love. <laughs> but the old tales are often right. History can turn on such human moments. Malinche was the one who would lead Cortés to his destiny. Cortés sails on up the coast, Malinche at his side. He keeps asking about gold. And everywhere, they tell him of a mysterious empire in the interior. A land called Mexico. He anchors at an island off the coast, the Isle of Sacrifices. Just off the modern port of Veracruz. And it was here that Cortés had his first encounter with the Aztecs. In his letters, you can still feel his sense of wonder. Since then, the tale has become a myth. It's even immortalized in the movies. On Easter Saturday, 1519, a magnificent embassy arrived from the ruler of Mexico. And even more strange, they seemed to have been expecting Cortés. Marina, find out who honors us in this royal manner. Yes, my lord. Not long one, one weekend. Malinche translates their Nahuatl. Say to the royal ambassador that I am pleased to welcome him to my camp. To his amazement, the Aztecs offer him wonderful gifts of gold. And though Cortes was pretending to be the ambassador of a great king. Of course, he couldn't respond in kind. And as gifts to the Aztecs, he scraped together a chair and some trinkets and a red velvet cap, which their ambassador accepted, though he looked at them as if they were excrement. Then came the crucial moment in the conversation. Do you have more gold, says Cortes, because I and my men suffer from a disease of the heart that can only be cured by gold? Yes, we do said the ambassador. There could hardly have been a more dangerous admission. Cortes now gave the Aztecs a show of his power. He fired his guns, rode his horses down the shore. The Aztecs were stunned. They'd never seen such things before. Their ambassador had his artists paint them as we would take photographs. The strangers, he said, have sticks which spurt fire. They ride deer high as a house which snort and foam. Cortes was invited to make a camp and he built a base here at Villa Rica. See it all from here, can't you? The little bay, the little headland where they built their fort. Tiny, isn't it? It's just the first enclave in the new world. But it all started from here.
And perhaps it was only now that Cortes dreamed up the plan to go to the city of Mexico. Could he somehow get the Aztecs to bow to Spanish power? Those nights by the sea, the locals told him of what lay ahead. How the Aztec Empire was built on fear and tribute. A tribute not only of things, but of people, of human hearts. The name of the Aztec ruler was Montezuma. But Montezuma was haunted by a prophecy, a legend of an exiled god who one day would return to claim his throne. So the Aztec spies urgently looked for signs. The stranger's white food, was it food of the gods? Their pale faces, could they be divine? It sounds incredible, and it probably sounded incredible to the Spanish. But the Aztec gods weren't like Christian ones. They were more like the gods of the ancient Greeks. Capricious, willful, mercurial, cruel. And the most enigmatic of them all was Quetzalcoatl. And according to the legend, when Quetzalcoatl was expelled from Mexico, he promised that one day he would return and regain his kingdom. But he'd come back across that sea out to the east, back here, with his chalky white face and his beard, in the Aztec year one reed. And by an amazing chance, 52 to one chance, this was that year. And for the Aztecs, nothing happened by chance. Cortez's men are getting nervous now. They know a great empire lies inland, and they know Cortez wants to go there. And now Cortez faces mutiny. He acts fast, kills the ringleader, and then, so no one can get away, he decides to pull his ships up on the beach and scupper them. It's a gambler's throw, isn't it? Destroying your own ships. They won't talk about going home anymore. Typical piece of Cortez. For now, he knows what he needs to know about the Aztecs, but if he's going to persuade his men to follow him into the interior, then he needs to hitch them to his dreams. To leave them, as he put it, with nothing to rely on but their own hands and the assurance that they must either conquer or die. The hesitation was over. Cortes heads inland with some native allies from the coast who were keen to throw off the Aztec yoke. He took a back road towards Montezuma's capital, Tenochtitlan, hoping along the way to find friends among Montezuma's enemies. The little towns they came through are still here, Cotepec, Hiko. And every place we passed through, says the conquistador Ben Aldias, we saw altars for human sacrifice. By some, there were thousands of skulls. The Christian in Cortes was revolted. Here in Hiko, he told the people they must give up their idols. Speaking in Nahuatl, the Aztec language, Malinche gave a potted history of Christianity. And then she explained to the people of the town that the Pope had given the King of Spain authority over their lands in the name of Almighty God. There's a story that uh, two chiefs who heard this said they were quite prepared to believe that there was one all-powerful God. But as for the idea that the Pope had given their lands to somebody else who lived so far away, the Pope must have been drunk. 
The Spaniards were still trying to make sense of confusing signs. The stench of blood mingled with the scent of flowers. Familiar European categories of life and death, nurture and feeding, were upside down. To quench their thirst, the Spaniards were given the juice bled from the fleshy white heart of the Mague cactus. Wow, it's absolutely beautiful. Only to learn this was the drink given to sacrificial victims to dull the senses of those who were about to die. Every day, says Bernal Diaz, we were told they'd kill us and eat our flesh with chilies. And the warm drink made from the cacao bean, which the Aztecs called chocolatl, chocolate, was prepared for the eagle warriors who feasted on the flesh of their defeated enemies. Human sacrifice here is long gone, but chocolatl is still drunk at religious feasts, and the Aztec language still survives. And with the language, hints of Aztec attitudes to love and sex. <laughs> For all their obsession with death, the Aztecs still loved life. I can't tell you what that means. <laughs> Cortez pushed on, and now we had to follow him on foot. Yeah. Okay. Ahead of us, says Cortez, we saw a great range of beautiful mountains, the peaks so white we think they must be covered with snow. With him, Cortes had 300 conquistadors, 40 of them crossbowmen, 20 musketeers. There were several hundred Indians and Cuban servants. And of course, his precious horses, 15 of them. After a summer on the Caribbean coast, the Spaniards were in for a shock. the conquistadors, Bernal Diaz, says when they came into the mountains here, it just rained and rained. The path turned into torrents. All they had was their cotton armor for the tropics. They just were completely unprepared for the change of temperature going up to 11,000 feet, soaking wet and freezing cold. Some of their Indian servants died. So far as we know, Cortes had no military training, but he never lost the respect of his army. The thing you have to remember about the conquistadors is that putting themselves through this, that they were all volunteers. They were in it not for religion or anything like that, but a share of the profits. They were free men. They acknowledged their leader's authority, but he had to pay attention to their feelings and respect them. And they called each other Compadre, comrade, they're all in it together. Got the pass up there, Ray? Uh -huh. Ray? That's the pass, is it? Yeah, yeah. 
that would pass, that the top. Cortez called it Nombre de Dios, the name of God. Okay. Okay. 13,000 feet. Can't see. Oh, it's hard. Muchas gracias. <laughs> Those nights, the native women he'd brought from the coast made them tortillas, some compensation. I tell you that we have tents tonight, and we are certainly going to be soaking cold and miserable, just as Hernan Cortez and his men were, as Bernard Diaz tells the story. This cloud's not going to lift. Right. As they marched deeper inland, they heard more about what they ahead. The locals said that to capture Mexico would be impossible, says Bernal Diaz, and we would all die. But the more they told us that, the more we longed to try our fortune. After the mountains, though, things got no better. Through autumn hailstorms, they trekked across a desolate plain of salt lakes with no food or water. Cortez was heading for the fertile land of Tlaxcala. Tlaxcala was an independent city-state. They hated the Aztecs. Cortez was hoping they'd shelter him, but his luck was out. They attacked him in a savage battle. On the battlefield, they still plow up the debris. Buenos días. Buenos días. Es, estoy buscando uh, la ruta de Hernán Cortez. La, la, la batalla... Pasó ahí. ¿Ahí? Sí. ¿Aquí? Sí. Ah, sí, sí, sí. Almost looks like glass, doesn't it? But this is obsidian. You see the sharp edge to it. They had a row of these things along the, the uh, set into the wood of the clubs that they used. Yeah, yeah. Um, nasty wound, but nothing like Spanish steel. There were 149,000 of them, Cortes wrote to the king in Julius Caesar mode. It was touch and go. He hung on grimly on this little hill for two weeks. And then, with their own losses mounting to the Spanish guns, the Tlaxcalans offered him a deal. They welcomed him into their town and laid on a fiesta, even offered him their daughters in marriage. The Tlaxcalans had realized that these strangers with their guns could help free them from the Aztecs. Ever since, they've been accused by other Mexicans of betraying their country. But of course, that's not how they see it. Chicotencatl, the elder, reaches for Hernán Cortés, who returns the embrace but he doesn't let go of his sword. The old Xicotencatl knew the future of his people was at stake. He believed this alliance would ensure that Tlaxcalans would not disappear from the map, would not disappear from history.
Because the alliance with the Tlash Karlans is the turning point of the whole story. In fact, it's a turning point in the history of the New World. Because with them, Cortes had found allies who hated the Aztecs and would fight them to the death. Allies who would give him support, provisions, and manpower. The possibility of conquering Mexico was now on. So Cortes marched on with several thousand Tlaxcalan warriors behind him. To the greatest pilgrimage city in the Americas, Cholula, under the volcano Popocatapetl. The people here were friends of Montezuma, and the Tlaxcalans warned Cortes to expect trouble. Spanish moved through the town, they saw roadblocks in the side streets, piles of stones heaped on the rooftops. Women and children had been evacuated. And then Malinche heard a story that a plot was being hatched to ambush Cortes. And he decided on a preemptive strike. He summoned the hundred lords of Cholula to meet him in the great courtyard of the temple of Quetzalcoatl. It's now the church of San Gabriel. And there, Malinche told them in Nahuatl that they'd committed treason and they would die for it. The doors were closed, the Spaniards killed them all, and they killed 3,000 more Cholulans who were assembled outside. And then their Tlaxcalan allies sacked the town. And so death came to Cholula says the Aztec account. When we got the news, we were seized with fear. It was as if the earth itself were shaking. My heart burns as if it's been washed in chilies, said Montezuma. From Cholula, Cortes continued up the old track through the forests of Popocatapetl. It was erupting then, as it is now. Finally, the Spanish army came down through the clouds into the Valley of Mexico. In the distant haze, they began to make out a vast blue lake. And then, at last, far away, approached on immense causeways, was the city of Cortes' dreams. It seemed like an enchanted vision, wrote one of his men. Indeed, some of our soldiers asked whether it was not all a dream. It was so wonderful that I do not know how to describe this first glimpse of things never heard of, seen, or dreamed of before. The city had traders and warriors, priests and lawyers, musicians, jugglers, courtesans, and scribes. It was the most beautiful thing in the world, wrote Cortez. Believe it or not, that's where the causeway came in in the 16th century. This is where the lake ended and the city began. This is where Cortes walked that November 1519. The Aztec city started here. <laughs> And though Montezuma's Tenochtitlan is long gone, it's still possible to trace the events on the ground. Chimalpopoca. Chimalpopoca. 
fantastic. All these local place names were carefully handed down by the Aztec eyewitnesses, almost, one guesses, as an act of remembrance. Fantastic. So this, this was the first canal in the Aztec city. So when Cortes met Montezuma for the first time, it was just there, where, it, where the main road crossed it. Not a very edifying place today, but that's it. Montezuma led Cortes to his palace in what's now the commercial heart of Mexico City. The site today is the Hospital of Jesus. To find the exact spot, you have to go through accident and emergency. The Aztecs led the Spanish into a great courtyard the framed by a beautiful building. It was on this spot. The tale of that momentous meeting is told by the Aztec eyewitnesses. This is where the two worlds met. It's where Montezuma addressed Cortes. Oh, my lord, he said, you are fatigued. You are weary after your long journey. At last, you have come down to earth. You have come to your city of Mexico, which I have guarded for you for a little while. They said you would return, and now you have done so. But first, go to your palace and rest and go in peace. Mysterious words. But what do they mean? Was this the language of Aztec diplomacy or Montezuma's acceptance of destiny? No one knows. But in the Aztec calendar, that day, the 8th of November, was one wind, the day of Quetzalcoatl. A day of robbery, violation and deceit. And the Aztecs knew that nothing ever happened by chance. It was as if we'd all eaten stupefying mushrooms, say the Aztec witnesses. We kept our children off the streets, and the city went to sleep in a fearful slumber. The city woke as it always had. In the streets of the modern world, we can only dimly imagine its splendor. The flutes and conch shells greeting the dawn, the bustle of merchants, the tens of thousands of blooms carried each day to markets drenched in the scents of the Americas. The Spaniards were open-mouthed at the sights, the gleaming stucco of the palaces and pyramids. They wandered the courtyards, gawped at strange gods. But on the wind, with the scent of flowers, they caught the ever-present smell of death. And in their hearts, they feared that Cortes, the gambler, had led them into the jaws of hell. Montezuma, though, was still unsure who Cortes was and who his master was, the great King Charles across the sea. So now Montezuma proudly shows Cortes the Pyramid of the War God 
on whose summit thousands of captives had had their hearts cut out. Perhaps the gods would recognize each other. Trying hard to appear calm, the Spaniards entered the chamber. The first thing the Spanish noticed when they came inside was the disgusting smell. And then, as their eyes got used to the darkness, they saw the eyes of the Aztec gods staring at them, gleaming with precious stones. The war god, Huitzilopochtli, was sitting down with a golden bow and arrow, and in front of him was a brazier full of human hearts still warm. And all around, the walls were encrusted with dried blood. Cortes then said this to Montezuma, I don't understand how a prince as great as you and a man as intelligent as you could think that these are gods. They are bad things called devils. And I'd like your permission to put a cross and a picture of the Virgin Mary inside here. Montezuma took offense at that. If I thought you were going to be so insulting to our gods, he said, I would never have brought you in here to see them. We hold these things to be good. They bring us health, harvests, rain and water, and we must sacrifice to them. So please don't mention this again. It was quite a gulf. For the Christians, God gave his blood to redeem mankind. For the Aztecs, mankind must give its blood to redeem the gods. A week passed. Cortez had to act, and now he raises the stakes with an unbelievable gamble. At gunpoint, he arrests Montezuma. What we want you to do now is to come over with us to the palace where we're lodging. Quietly and with no fuss. If you make a noise or raise the alarm, we will kill you. Montezuma is amazed. Nothing he's learned in the palace of nobles of the Aztecs has prepared him for this. My person cannot be taken prisoner, he says to Cortez. Even if I were to like it, my people would never accept it. The argument goes on for four hours. Montezuma in tears at one point, and all the while Cortez's captains are pacing up and down, getting more and more nervous, and then one of them says, look, either he comes with us now, or we kill him now. And when Malinche translates that, Montezuma caves in. Montezuma was now in Cortes' power, maybe under his spell. He continued to issue orders as if things were normal, but he'd lost the trust of his people. The tale has been told many times. How the angry mob besieged the Spanish, how Cortes bullied poor, broken Montezuma to plead with them. But Montezuma's aura had drained away and his people killed him. The Spaniards were trapped inside the city, food and water cut off. His dream slipping from his grasp, Cortes was forced to give the order to escape. You have to remember, the city was on an island, completely surrounded by water, linked to the mainland only by three great causeways. All the bridges had been broken by the Aztecs. So in those final few hours, the Spaniards built a portable wooden bridge out of the ceiling beams of the palace where they were staying. They would leave at midnight. The night was clear with a gentle rain. The Spaniards marched in silence, hugging their gold. Halfway into the lake, they were spotted. The alarm was raised and the city woke. Cortes was trapped. The Aztec witnesses named the place. Today, it's by the little post office on the Tacoba Road. Three quarters of the Spaniards were left behind, 800 men killed, drowned, or captured. 
and the captives could expect only one fate at the hands of the enraged Aztecs. They were taken back into the city to the Great Pyramid, and there their hearts were cut out and offered to Huitzilopochtli, the god of war. On the far shore, Cortez gathered the survivors by a huge saber tree. It's still there. Malinche, they say, showed no emotion, but Cortez, for once, couldn't control his feelings. They said there were tears in Cortez's eyes that night, the night of tears. But of all his comrades who died, he asked after only one, Martin Lopez, the shipbuilder. And when Cortez heard that Lopez had survived, although badly wounded, he said, Vamos, que nada nos falta. Okay, let's go, for we lack nothing. And when the Spaniards had thus gone, say the Aztecs, we thought they had gone forever and would never return. But across the mountains, the Tlaxcalans stood by Cortes. And what he does now is one of the most amazing things in history. In the middle of the land, he builds a fleet. That's why he needed Martin Lopez. They're going to build uh, 13 brigantines, and all of them are in more than 40 feet long, and they're going to take them to bits, and they're going to carry them all the way to Mexico City. This is, what, do you, what, what does the maestro think about this? This is an incredible idea. <laughs> Supposedly, they disassembled the fleet to carry it, as there are no navigable rivers around here. For Mexicans, Cortés was a very cruel man. But from a buccaneering point of view, he was great. Cortés would not let go of his dream. And now, inexorably, the net began to tighten around the Aztecs. Cortés transports his prefabricated fleet, carried in pieces by a train of 8,000 Tlaxcalan porters. Across the mountains, and back to the lake. On the lake shore, he waited with thousands of native allies. It was May, 1521. Cortés' moment of destiny had arrived. It was to be nothing less than a war of the worlds. Cortés' plan was to lay siege to the city and cut off its food and water supplies. Then, supported by his ships, he would attack it along the causeways, whose line is still marked today by the main routes into the city. It was a new kind of warfare for the Mexicans, sieging a city involving the, the ordinary population, the women and children, starving them. This wasn't part of war in ancient Mexico. But Cortes, of course, was a modern man. It was total war. The siege lasted for 80 days, a quarter of a million people were reduced to eating lizards and grass. Devastated by European diseases, the Aztecs under their new king Cuauhtémoc still refused to negotiate, and the Spanish had to win the city street by street. In the last battle, 
the Aztecs were squashed into the warren of streets round the Great Pyramid in the north, in Tlatelolco. I'm looking for the ancient barrios of Mexico City, not the modern ones, okay? Especially I want to go to the area of Tepito, okay? Tepito? Yeah, do you know that area? Yes, I know, but it's a little dangerous. You don't care? Well, do you know it? Yeah. Okay. Um, Yacacolco? No. Tlacochalco? Amashak? Any... No, I don't know. There's nothing, nothing about it. Do you have a map? Yeah, yes, yeah. Well, um, show me, maybe I can get uh, some. It's uh, from Jesus, seven... What, what kind of map it is, eh? It's from 1772. Oh, no, no. You have a, a round deal, man. Mexico uh, City's got a bit bigger since yeah. then, not it? <laughs> okay. Yeah, it seems crazy, but this map, which was drawn in 1772, Mexico City is still inside what was the old island. And you can still see the, the network of canals and the main roads of the Aztec city are still there. Now this is old Amashak Road, which the Aztecs talk about. This is where the heaviest fighting took place. Just a bit further up here is Yacacolco. To the end, the Mexicans viewed the Spaniards as contemptible people who killed brave warriors at a distance with guns. In the Aztec calendar, the final day was three serpent the beginning of the time of lamentation and remembrance, the day human beings were reminded of their place in the remorseless cycle of time. So this is where the war ended, the exact spot. This little church was built on the place where Cuauhtémoc surrendered. I find the Aztec version of this story as powerful and moving as Homer's Iliad, the tale of Troy. The Aztecs accept their fate without a trace of self-pity. It's as if in their vision of time and destiny, the cycle of history, the bundle of years, had just been loaded against them. The Aztec lamentations have been handed down to us. Broken spears lie in the streets. We have torn our hair in grief. Our houses are roofless now, our walls red with blood. Our inheritance, our city, is lost. The shields of our warriors were its defense, but they could not save it. Our heritage is gone. A year or two after the conquest, while a new Mexico was rising on the ruins of the old, Cortes founded a hospital for the good of his soul, on the spot where Montezuma had welcomed him. By then the King of Spain had showered him with honours. The poor boy from Medellin had become the most famous man in Christendom. His talent served him well. The gambler who gambled everything and won. But maybe in the end it was a hollow victory. For in achieving his dream, he had to ruin it. It's given to few people in history, single-handedly, to destroy a civilization. <laughs>